So welcome to um, our first P Talk of 2022. Very exciting. We've got loads of them coming up over the next month or so. We've got this one today with uh, Dr. Ali Leach, and then we've got uh, one coming up with uh, NatWest Bank on the 2nd of February, and then we've got another one with uh, Dr. Joe Hale from University College London coming up on the 19th or the 16th of February as well. I unfortunately can't remember that date off the top of my head, but all of these things will be sent out to you. So welcome to everyone who's here and hopefully we'll see you all at future talks as well. Um, so that, like I say, today we have a researcher who literally I have been citing for the last two years, uh, her research around environmental labelling, which is totally my field too. And I'm so excited to have Dr. Ali Leach with us today from the, whoa, okay, from the University of New Hampshire. What, what's your current affiliation, Ali? It's still the University of New Hampshire, even though I live a state away. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna ask follow-up questions about that because that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> remote work and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Ali Leach from the University of New Hampshire, who's going to talk about food labels. And uh, Ali, if you just want to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about yourself, and then we'll dive into your topic. So it'll be about 20 minutes. If people have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat during the talk, and then I can kind of, you know, um, say them all and read them all out at the end, or save the question to the end if you prefer. If you want to talk directly, then please just put your hand up or something, and then you can say your question with your own words rather than me saying it with mine. Um, but yeah, other than that, hope you enjoy. And Ali, over to you. Well, thanks so much, Jack. Thanks so much for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm so happy to be here with this group. I've uh, really enjoyed learning about your group, Psychologists for Environmental Action. I think it sounds like exactly the kind of like, collaboration um, for interdisciplinary work that we need to address environmental challenges. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, so as Jack said, my name is Ali. I'm a researcher with the University of New Hampshire Sustainability Institute. And uh, most of my work right now focuses on um, carbon and nitrogen footprints for colleges and universities where food is part of that. And all of my background is um, really in footprinting, primarily in nitrogen footprints, actually. So um, at the, before I was at the University of New Hampshire, where I did my uh, PhD and I'm now doing a postdoc, I was at the University of Virginia, which is where the work that I'm sharing today actually started. And at UVA worked on developing a, a campus level nitrogen footprint model and the food footprint calculation factors uh, for the nitrogen footprint. And uh, I was telling Jack before you all logged on that this uh, label work actually came out of a group similar to your group. Uh, it was a group of researchers um, in the environmental sciences department at UVA, all interested in environmental footprints in some capacity. Some had uh, some expertise in it, some were just interested in learning more, and it was um, faculty, staff, and students. And we all started to get together every week just to chat about footprints, um, started sharing some papers and uh, getting into the literature some more, and then found something we wanted to collaborate on. So I found some questions that we didn't think we liked how they were full, we didn't think they were fully answered in the literature and wanted to develop an integrated um, footprint label. So um, I was excited to hear about the group that um, you all have bringing together folks from different backgrounds interested in a, a common theme here. So today, um, we're gonna start with a little bit of background. So start really at the beginning. So why, um, why we care about the environmental impact of food production, what those impacts are, and how we calculate the carbon, nitrogen, and water footprint of food. Then going to take a very brief tour into a tool that um, I co-developed at the University of New Hampshire called SIMAP. So it's a tool for colleges and universities and organizations to calculate their carbon and nitrogen footprint. So I know this group is interested in uh, sustainability work at Durham University, and it might uh, could be a tool that uh, might be useful for achieving some of your goals in terms of reducing environmental impacts at Durham. Then we're gonna focus in on environmental impact food labels and finally look at a case study at the University of Virginia uh, where they use these labels, actually partnered some students, environmental scientists partnered with social psychologists at UVA to conduct this study. Okay, so starting at the very beginning here, why do we, why do we care about food? So food, of course, it's central to life, to health, 
to culture, to quality of life. And we all need food and we have a growing global population that needs more food as it grows. And at the same time, um, global meat consumption is increasing on a total and per capita basis. And as you'll see later on, when we take a closer look at the footprints, meat production is more resource intensive for really any type of resource. So not only do we need to be producing more food, uh, there's a growing demand for more resource intensive food. And food production has a range of environmental impacts. Uh, this is just a, a snapshot of some of the bigger ones here, but there are more. The greenhouse gas emissions, of course, are a big one. Um, some common examples there are uh, enteric fermentation, or as there, it's as more commonly known, uh, cow burps. Uh, manure management is another source of greenhouse gas emissions and um, uh, food waste, uh, soil respiration, and there's more. The nutrient pollution is uh, nitrogen and phosphorus losses to the environment. Some sources of that are like fertilizer runoff and manure management. Those are really the two big ones there, but there are others. Freshwater consumption, so any type of food that we grow, we need to use fresh water, which um, is uh, limited in amounts, especially depending on where you are. Um, I just moved out here from Colorado and where I lived for a few years and there was a um, um, very limited fresh water supply there. So it was a um, very important topic out West here. And biodiversity loss, which is caused by um, many different aspects of food production, including nutrient losses and pesticide use and then land use. It's the last one I wanted to highlight here. And uh, land use change um, occurs when we need to clear land for food production. Perhaps the most common example is uh, deforestation in the Amazon, which has big implications for um, the global carbon cycle. So uh, we could spend um, a lot of time talking about each one of these, but wanted to just show a, a snapshot of them. And today we're really focusing in on the first three. So greenhouse gas emissions um, being referred to as the carbon footprint, uh, nutrient pollution, focusing in on the nitrogen footprint, although there is also a phosphorus footprint now as well. We just haven't added that into this analysis yet. And the water footprint. So why do these food footprints matter? Um, because we want to maintain the benefits of our modern agricultural system, and there are many. So we're producing more food than ever. Um, improved agricultural technologies mean improved efficiency, so less resources required to produce food. And one example of that is intensification, which although it has some negative consequences, it does save land. So there's um, lots of benefit that we get from our modern agricultural system, but also a lot of consequences. So we have to figure out how uh, to address these challenges to ensure that our food system is sustainable and just. So today we're focusing on environmental impacts of food, um, but there's many other like, social impacts of food. Um, so the challenge from an environmental perspective then is producing enough healthy food while minimizing those environmental consequences, which brings us to footprints. So food footprints are one way to help uh, translate those environmental impacts into a, a metric um, that's um, easier to understand and relate to. So it condenses a lot of information into a single metric. And uh, food footprints or footprint in general is defined as the pressure on the environment from resource consumption. So an important um, clarification for footprints is that they don't usually go all the way to the actual environmental impact. They're giving um, an estimate of the pressure resulting from resource consumption or an activity. And there's lots of different types of footprints. The three we're looking at today are the water footprint, which is freshwater consumption uh, during food production. And uh, the water footprint, you can get um, more detail. There's actually three different types of water footprints the blue water footprint, green water footprint, and gray water footprint. Um, today, we're looking at the, the blue water footprint, which is irrigation water, and the green water footprint, which is essentially rainwater, um, and not including the gray water footprint, but happy to talk more about those if there's any questions. Then the carbon footprint is shorthand for all greenhouse gas emissions during food production. So not just CO2, it also includes um, other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide that are really important to include when you're talking about um, agriculture and greenhouse gas emissions. Then the nitrogen footprint, um, which is where uh, my background is, is the nitrogen pollution losses during food production. 
and nitrogen losses occur from sources like fertilizer runoff, crop processing waste, uh, food waste, manure management, really every step of the food supply chain, uh, we see nitrogen losses. It's a very um, leaky element. And once it gets into the environment, um, reactive nitrogen, which is all forms of nitrogen except the unto that makes up most of our atmosphere. So it's everything else like ammonia, um, nitrous oxide, um, nitrate, there's many forms, but anytime one of those forms gets into the environment, it can then uh, move through the environment, move through the different spheres of the environment and cause a series of environmental impacts. And it's called the nitrogen cascade. So that's why it's all the more important to manage uh, nitrogen pollution at the source so that it doesn't get out into the environment to start with. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at each of these footprints across food categories. So what we're gonna do is start with the water footprint and then I'm building on um, the, the carbon footprint and the nitrogen footprint so we can see comparisons across food categories here. So the water footprint and um, these values all come, we compiled um, uh, these emission factors from uh, various literature sources. So usually a meta-analysis when it was available. Uh, they're mostly US averages um, that we have in our data set here, but these factors are available for um, different countries. And really the biggest differences you see uh, the, that holds across really any country you're looking at is that the biggest differences are across food categories. Sorry for the background noise. Right here on a, a busy road. Hopefully that's better now. Um, okay, so the water footprint here, what these factors are showing is the uh, liters of fresh water required to produce one kilogram of food. So these factors here vary from about 100 liters, which is still a good bit of water, um, for vegetables and potatoes, all the way up to 6,600 liters of uh, fresh water to produce one kilogram of beef. So a, a, a pretty big range there and some pretty large quantities of water. So now we're adding the carbon footprint and you might be starting to see some trends emerging here. So the carbon footprint tells us the um, kilograms of greenhouse gases normalized to carbon dioxide equivalents. That's what that ECO2 here stands for emitted to, from producing a one kilogram of food. So also a pretty big range here from the low end, uh, about 0.2 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents, all the way up to 27 kilograms of CO2 equivalents for beef. And then we're gonna add our last footprint here. So um, nitrogen, we've got little bags of fertilizer to represent that one. And the nitrogen footprint is the grams of nitrogen released while producing one kilogram of food. And this one, um, as I mentioned earlier, is also a, a normalized metric. So it's different types of reactive nitrogen, um, all converted to grams of nitrogen. And also see a big range here. So on the low end, about six kilograms of, or excuse me, six grams of nitrogen, all the way up to 460 grams of nitrogen. So what I hope you all are seeing here is some pretty consistent trends that are emerging that I'm sure you all are, um, are familiar with, with the work that you've already done um, with this group and for your own research. And that's that the, the animal-based products um, overall have larger footprints than the um, plant-based products. The carbon and nitrogen footprints align really closely. Um, there's some uh, plant-based products that have a slightly larger water footprint. So beans and grains, um, oils as well have a larger water footprint. But overall, this trend really holds that the um, meat and animal products have a more emissions and require more resources than the plant-based products. And that makes sense, of course, because when you're, um, when you're growing these products, when you're producing animal-based products, you also need to grow plants that you then feed to the animals. So there's extra steps and extra um, and more steps to, to, that require resource use and have losses. 
So I want to take a quick detour here to take a look at a different way that these factors are applied. So we'll go into the environmental labels in just a moment here. Um, but these footprint factors can be used really in any footprint tool. Um, and this is the tool for colleges and universities um, that we have at UNH. It's a carbon and nitrogen footprint tool um, for tracking campus-wide sustainability. It brought together two tools, the carbon footprint and the nitrogen footprint. And we brought these uh, together um, because these two footprints are driven by the same activities. Food is one of those. I'll show you the contribution of food in just a moment here. Um, so is any kind of energy use, fossil fuel use, and other resource use like fertilizer application, even purchase goods and services at a, um, at a university or other organization has a footprint associated with it. So these two activities are, or excuse me, these two footprints are driven by the same activities. Um, but the breakdown within that footprint is different. And so that gives you more information for sustainability decision-making. So this is a screenshot of the, um, the tool with results from the University of New Hampshire across time here. And it's the footprints by category. And the, the part of it that I wanna draw your attention to that you might already be noticing is this uh, salmon pink bar at the top, which is uh, food production, the emissions from food production. On the um, carbon footprint, um, this uh, contribution is pretty consistent with what we see for colleges and universities where food makes up about five to 15% of a carbon footprint, also pretty consistent with what we see on a global basis. And on the nitrogen side, um, food makes up um, by far the majority of an organization's nitrogen footprint. And this trend holds regardless of what scale you're looking at. If it's an individual, an organization, a country, food is really uh, a driving factor for the nitrogen footprint, uh, making up more than half, often more than uh, three quarters of a nitrogen footprint. And the rest of these footprints is primarily driven by uh, energy use, fossil fuel combustion. Um, so things like electricity use and heating and other energy and commuting requirements. And um, because of our interest in food and because a lot of um, universities are becoming more interested in food sustainability, we put together a food report in SIMAP that highlights um, what food types are driving the footprint. So on the left, we've got the food weight for two years, 2014 and 2015 in this example, where orange is um, the weight uh, of meat categories, purple is animal products, uh, green is primary plant-based products like fruits and vegetables and grains. And then blue is secondary plant-based products like oils and sugars. On the left, you can see that the plant-based products are making up most of the uh, purchase by weight, but of course the story is flipped on the right graph there. And the same trend holds if we're looking at the carbon footprint. Um, so this is one way that you can use these footprint factors um, and wanted to, to briefly mention here some opportunities for reduction that these, um, these food footprints are really driven by uh, food type. That's really what the, um, the, the, the main thing you can um, change as an individual consumer to reduce your food footprint is the type of food you eat. We see small differences within food categories. So depending on how the food product is um, produced, there you can have some reductions there with improved efficiency. But the biggest differences are really uh, changing food type and also reducing food waste. So with this in mind, how do we then communicate that to a broader audience? And that brings us to food labels. So when our group, um, the, we called ourselves the footprint group at the University of Virginia started looking into footprints, uh, we saw that a lot of the labels out there really were just telling us the amount of emissions, which wasn't very meaningful. Even as uh, people who researched this field, we didn't always necessarily know like is, is one kilogram good? Like how does that compare to, to other similar products? And um, where the field has been moving and what we wanted to do is try to provide some more context and make this um, something that was easier to interpret. And uh, since we all had um, expertise in different footprints, we also wanted to bring together multiple footprints to give consumers more information in decision making. So we wanted to bring together the carbon, nitrogen and water footprint, and then also design a label that would be easy to understand for a consumer at the grocery store who um, has a, considering a lot of different things in their food purchases. 
So we um, really had three steps in calculating our ultimate um, star rating or sustainability rating. And the first um, was, was fairly time intensive, but the calculation, the ultimate calculation is really straightforward. So we needed to compile um, all of the relevant emission factors from the literature, uh, make sure they were consistent in terms of system bounds. So that's important when you're comparing across emission factors and emission types, you wanna make sure that you're looking at the same system bounds. So we compiled those factors, but then the calculation itself is really quite simple. You have the weight of food and you multiply it by your emissions factor and you get your footprint. Um, so you do that for all three footprints. And then we needed a way to convert those emissions or that um, resource use into something um, that would be more meaningful for a consumer. So the first step that we took was converting it into a percent daily value. So we came to this concept um, because it's pretty common on nutrition labels um, that we have. And we're thinking of it in terms of um, a percent daily value that you don't want to exceed. So think of your salt intake, for example, the percent daily value is a maximum that you don't want to exceed. So what we did is we calculated the, um, we found a, a reference footprint. And in this case, it was a healthy diet recommended by uh, the US Department of Agriculture. And there's been a lot of work recently in defining a sustainable diet. And there's a big range for these, but we wanted to have just a general um, healthy diet as our reference point, something that would be on the somewhat more uh, conservative or, or higher end of that possible range of sustainable footprints. And then for that, we calculated the emissions associated with each of those um, footprints for the, that healthy diet. And then the percent daily value is calculated as the food footprint divided by your reference footprint, where 100% is your, your total for the day. Then we needed a way to make that um, useful for looking at an individual serving or individual meal. So we use that to then um, convert it to a star rating from zero to five. And one thing that required um, was uh, assigning percent daily values to star ratings. And we did that for both meals and um, like a snack or a single serving because the assignment would, um, or the percent would vary based on that. So here you can see that it's really based on having um, three roughly evenly sized meals a day where um, a sustainable meal would be less than a third or about a third of your or less of your um, percent daily value. And if it's making up more than, if one single meal is making up more than two thirds of your percent daily value, then we said that would be considered unsustainable Then moderate is in between. Uh, we have a different rating system for snacks, uh, looking at how many servings a day on average an individual would have across different food types and have a different percent daily value rating for those. So we then um, started to define, design some labels that incorporated uh, this concept, the percent daily value concept. So here we've got one label that takes into account um, uh, some stoplight color coding where it adds in the green to indicate it's sustainable, yellow for moderate. Uh, this is I think for chicken, so there's not a red for this one since chicken has a more uh, moderate footprint for um, uh, relative to other animal-based products. And then we also built it into the US uh, nutrition fact label. So just inserted it at the end here um, as a way to show that how it could be incorporated into existing labels. Um, but we thought that this maybe provided a, a, wasn't enough context maybe and might be information overload as well. So it'd be something new that consumers would have to um, uh, understand and learn about when they're already overwhelmed with information at the grocery store. So we then looked at emission equivalencies. So uh, converting the, the footprint to something that we might be more familiar with for each footprint. So this example is for a serving of chicken. Um, and so for the carbon footprint, we said that would be equivalent to driving three miles. Uh, for the nitrogen footprint, a serving of chicken would be equivalent to essentially throwing a third of a cup of fertilizer out into the environment. And then for the water footprint, it'd be equivalent to uh, two showers. So trying to put it into context. Um, still, again, a lot to read, a lot of information. So the label that we really liked and 
uh, have used is a star label. So a really simple rating label from, we now use uh, zero to five because we thought three stars wasn't really um, enough to factor in or to reflect um, more nuanced differences or smaller differences across food products. So you can use different symbols. We've used leaves, trees. Um, here we've got a snowflake for a, um, a holiday recipe example that we just um, used at um, UNH this past holiday season. Um, so lots you can do with it to adapt it to um, a particular, um, particular application and also easy for a consumer to understand where zero stars is the worst, five stars is the best. And um, we've actually put together a, a food label toolkit. So if any of you are interested in calculating, um, calculating some of these ratings, uh, this is a, just a simple Excel spreadsheet um, that we uh, took uh, the methodology that we had in our food labels paper and took our spreadsheet that um, we used for the calculations and cleaned it up, made it more user-friendly and um, added in some color coding um, so that you could enter in, all you need to enter in here is the for each meal and there's another tab for snacks, um, the type of food from a drop down, and then the weight of that food, and then the uh, spreadsheet calculates out um, the calories, protein, um, carbon footprint, nitrogen footprint, and assigns all the, the daily values and star ratings. And you can also see what's happening behind the scenes for the calculations on the other tabs as well. Um, so this is what we use whenever we are doing uh, these uh, calculations. We just use this, this spreadsheet. So happy to share this if it would be um, of interest to any of you. Um, and so now what I'd like to do is take a look at some ways that we've used these labels. So this is first just an example um, that I mentioned from um, the Sustainability Institute, the department I'm in at UNH, uh, where for our holiday newsletter, um, we all compiled uh, some of our favorite uh, recipes and um, shared those. And then I actually I calculated a sustainability rating for each one of those. Now you, um, as you might guess from a, uh, an organization all about sustainability, all of the ratings were very high. Uh, I think the lowest was 4.5 out of five stars. So you can't see it on this screenshot, but at the end I included a, a reference to a, a more typical American meal of like a Christmas ham and potatoes and, and green beans for comparison, since uh, most meals aren't quite this sustainable. Uh, but it was a, a fun way to, um, fun way to, uh, communicate the sustainability and show a little bit about what we do at this department. Then a case study, um, which um, also came out of the, the footprint group that I mentioned, um, this happened after I, I left UVA, but I was able to continue working with them on this a little bit from afar, um, was an application where they actually took the labels and put them in a cafe at the University of Virginia. And in this picture here is Leah Catanio. She was a, a student at UVA who since graduated, who spearheaded the effort of getting the labels on these food products. So they um, got the labels on all the food products in the cafe and then teamed up with some social psychologists at UVA to design a study to with different levels of interventions to see how the labels affected uh, purchasing at this cafe. So what they found, and I'm just gonna show a snapshot of the results here. Um, and happy to share the paper um, if you all want to take a, a closer look at this, because I think this is probably an area that you all have um, much more expertise than I do in terms of uh, study design and the, um, the types of interventions and the findings here. But wanted to share this because I thought it was a, a neat application of using these types of labels. So one of their major findings, um, they did a couple of different studies at two different cafes at UVA, uh, was they looked at how the um, control of having no labels compared to having, um, having the labels on the products, how that alone with no additional intervention um, in terms of education or outreach, just no labels and labels, how that impacted purchasing. And uh, for products with a rating of um, less than four, which are unsustainable or moderate, um, for women in the study, 94% um, purchased those unsustainable products when there was no label. And you can see there was a big change where um, uh, only 62% of women purchased those unsustainable products when there was a label. So there was a big switch uh, in purchasing patterns from um, women. But you can see there's a part of the box I'm covering up here. Uh, the men in the study um, had 
really no change in purchasing patterns and actually purchase slightly more unsustainable products here um, in their study. And they also um, did some surveys along with this and um, uh, uh, had some interventions, as I mentioned, like some education, some questions about their values for purchasing. Uh, one of those, and I won't go through all the details here, but one of those was uh, participants rating what influenced their purchasing decision on a scale of one to four, one being it impacted it the least, four being it impacted it the most. And across the board, environmental concern was um, the, the lowest, had the lowest rating for um, these consumers. So I think this really underscores that consumers have lots of different things they're thinking about when they're purchasing food and environmental concern is just one of those. Uh, but you can see there was a, a slight increase um, in, in both populations here who said that when they uh, saw the labels, um, they rated environmental concern as something uh, that was slightly higher priority than the population that did not see the labels. So again, happy to share. This paper, um, this is a paper came out a couple of years ago, and then I was doing a little bit of uh, reading to, to see what else is out there to, to get ready for um, this talk today. And found a recent literature review that just came out last year. It's hard to believe that 2021 is now last year and that it's already 2022 here. I haven't quite gotten used to that. Uh, so this paper was in the Journal of Cleaner Production by Rondani and Grasso. And they looked at um, 38 different studies on consumer behavior towards carbon footprint labels on food. And this is just a snapshot of their findings here. Um, but their findings were pretty consistent with what that UVA study found. Uh, they found that there were more positive attitudes toward carbon labels for female adults with higher income and education levels. And um, some things that are you know, make sense, but were confirmed in these studies that people expressing higher environmental concern were also willing to pay more. Uh, takeaway across all of these studies was also that labels were still found confusing. So that more work is really needed to make these labels um, easier to understand for consumers who have um, taking in lots of information at the grocery store. So I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for um, discussion here. So to summarize, really two points I um, hope that you take away today are first that we're um, facing a challenge in our food production system and we see food footprints as one way to make progress on that challenge. So we need to figure out how to um, balance these benefits that we get from modern agriculture with the, the challenges and consequences from this agricultural system. And we think the footprints are a way to help track this and communicate this and make progress on it. And that labels in particular um, are also a way to help take this footprint information and this emission information and translate it into something that is um, able to be used uh, more broadly for, um, uh, for products and also for studies to help understand these impacts. So that I'd like to um, thank you all for for joining us today and happy to open it up to any questions. Amazing, thank you so much, Ali. that was so interesting. I personally have more questions than we could probably ever get through. Um, there's a few questions in the chat, but I see that someone has just raised their hand. So um, Adarsh Kumar, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question. Thank you so much. Um, hi, I'm Adush. I'm a, I work as a research professional at the University of Chicago Wood School of Business. Um, I work in the econ department. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, I'm actually just recently gotten very interested in this topic of, of food labels and trying to understand the sustainability of our food purchases at the grocery store and restaurants. Uh, and so to that end, um, my, some of the folks in my team and I are working on this stuff. And I'll try to connect with you offline uh, to, to get your inputs on that. But I'll start with one, which is how do you think about um, nitrogen pollution in relation to eutrophication? I believe there's some sort of like co uh, correlation in the concepts between the two. Uh, but I was wondering whether nitrogen pollution is a good uh, proxy for uh, eutrophication. Um it's, it's a major, um, the main cause really of it. So nitrogen pollution and um, phosphorus pollution, the, the two main um, nutrients that cause 
eutrophication are the main cause. And there's lots of factors that will determine um, what to what level you see nutrient pollution in a body of water, like how close that um, uh, nutrient pollution is to the body of water, um, what the uh, runoff or um, the transport of that nutrient pollution is to the body of water. Um, so there's lots of lots of modeling uh, that happens in between to understand um, how much of it is likely to to get to um, the body of water and contribute to um, eutrophication. But yes, it's definitely definitely the main cause there. Wonderful, thank you so much. I just have a very quick follow up. Um, another sure. question, if if that's fine, which is um, how when you think about these different factors like water, CO two, nitrogen. Um, how do you think about weighting them so that you come out with like a, a comprehensive single score? Yeah, that's a great question. And one that we struggled with a lot. How do you put a value on each of those footprints? Um, so what we ultimately did was we just did an average across all three because we didn't, uh, we, we didn't have a good way to um, weight one more heavily than the other. Um, but definitely open to, you know, discussions or suggestions around how those might be weighted. But that is something that we, we spent a bit of time discussing um, and weren't really sure how to, to value those. I know that one way that um, uh, some comparisons are being done is actually with uh, monetary valuation. And so there's work around the social cost of carbon. Um, there's similar work around nitrogen, uh, where it's more so around the cost to repair nitrogen pollution damage. So the, the effects that we feel and what the cost is of those effects, everything from human health impacts, like from uh, NOx, which contributes to air quality problems and the respiratory health impacts and the cost of those health impacts, all the way to uh, the cost of, you know, if you have a body of water with um, eutrophication that we can't use for recreation, what is the cost of, of that? Um, so there is work around like, actually valuing those and to put them into a similar metric, but we, we didn't go quite that far. We just weighted them evenly in this analysis. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I think um, in, in the EU, there's um, some pilots going on where I think the Foundation Earth is an organization and they use um, they gave a 49% weight to carbon and then 17, 17, 17 to water, uh, biodiversity and eutrophication. Um, and I think there are like many sort of like weights I'm seeing in my own sort of like research. So yeah, it's really interesting to see how, how folks think about this. Um, thank you so much for your responses. Um, I have a few more questions, but I'll, I'll, sort of, I'll allow others to, to read. Thanks Thank so much, Adash. You, you, you stole one of my questions already, so you're doing, doing we're all on the same sort of wavelength, I see. Um, Emma Garnett also has a hand raised. I'll just quickly read out this um, comment that's been put into the chat first before, we, before I throw to Emma to ask her question, which is from uh, Ninette Harris saying, great research. One thought I had on the results and the difference between women and men was the potential impact of diet culture on women and being more conscious of checking food labels compared to men who may not have the habit of checking labels before purchasing food. That's not really a question, but I suppose the question that I have from reading that is, do you know of any research or would you be interested in doing any research around, you know, like maybe some, some sort of like eye gaze thing around looking at labels and whether or not there's any gender differences there? That's a, a great thought and a, a great um, point there. I. Um, I don't know that this particular study went into understanding what the, the driving factors were behind those decisions. Um, and I'm not familiar with any, any research in that field, but does anyone not wanted to open up to see if anyone in this group might have, um, might be familiar with work that's looked into that. So I know for a fact that there is research, I don't know if they actually look at gender differences, there is definitely research that looks at the impact that uh, like eye gaze has on effectiveness of labels more generally and kind of it seems like quite an obviously intuitive answer that if you're looking at the label more you're more likely to be influenced by the label but I don't know if there's anything gender related. Um, if anyone has anything like that please chuck it in the chat or raise your hand afterwards but we'll throw over to Emma now to ask her question. So Emma over to you if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Great, thank you very much. Thinking about quite a lot is it, what are some of the stumbling blocks if we're looking at labels, environmental labels getting rolled out more widely, sort of if there's nationwide mandates. And 
I, I loved your the approach of looking at that percentage RDI. I thought that mapped really interestingly to nutrition and was sort of quite intuitive. I suppose, uh, how do we, so two related questions. One, kind of how do we navigate which recommended diet gets chosen? You know, are we looking at the Eat Lancet Planetary Health Diet? Are we looking at the USDA one? And I know there's been some concerns about industry lobbying to have more dairy included, for example. You'll have other diets where there's kind of more oily fish included because that's good for health, but it has some sustainability concerns. And then I suppose secondly, again, on the kind of rolling out labels more widely, is that I think very understandably, each country wants to defend its own farming practices and say, right, no, our farms are okay. It's someone else's problem. So in the UK, it's like, no, our grass fed beef is great. It's the US feedlots that are the problem and it's the Brazilian soy that's a problem. And you've got the US agricultural minister in COP26 saying, no, you know, Americans don't have to eat less beef. It's like, oh, it's the Amazon and like Bolsonaro. So that's the problem. So I suppose I see a really big political obstacle in that. I can't imagine the US government mandating for labels which involved US produced beef having a red label. I can't imagine, I struggle to imagine that happening in Brazil, in the UK. And similarly, I really notice in the UK, the food products were prepared that the, um, it's sort of acceptable to slag off essentially are like ones that we don't grow in the UK. So it's avocados, it's soy, it's palm oil. They're kind of safe commodities to criticize because you won't be criticizing domestic farmers. So you're just wondering about your thoughts on how we overcome that. And I've got some, a few data on gender stuff, which I can put in the chat. Yeah, I think you touched on um, a lot of the a lot of the challenges in implementing um, labels like this more broadly um, and and also some of the other topics that our group spent a lot of time um, discussing. So uh, one that you mentioned was what is the, the reference diet? Um, and that's one that we, we spent a lot of time uh, discussing, looking at different options. I mean, you're absolutely right that the USDA recommended diet um, has been influenced by lobbying. And so there's um, there's other diets that have been recommended. One that came out from um, Harvard that takes the USDA diet, but makes some adjustments uh, more uh, based in the in nutrition science, really, that maybe has less animal products in it. Um, and so what is that that reference diet would be a really important question for that. Um, we, we picked the USDA one um, uh, because one reason was that it did have a slightly higher footprint compared to other sustainable diets. Um, so another study that came out of the footprint group um, that was really interesting was uh, a paper, I believe it was called um, uh, the environment. I, I can't remember what it was called now, actually. I'll, I'll have to look it up and I can drop it in the chat. But basically it was, what is the um, the minimum possible environmental footprint um, that would still get all of your nutrients? And uh, the way it came out was something eat, like eating 40 servings of vegetables a day and a little bit of nuts and a little bit of uh, seafood. So not a... Um, not a, uh, a reasonable diet to propose, I don't think, but it was just what what would you need to eat to get the um, the minimum nutrient requirements, but there were lots of options um, in between, of course. So picking that reference diet, I think would be one of the biggest challenges for implementing something like this um, more broadly, and maybe it would vary, I'm sure it would need to vary uh, by country, even by application. Um, another challenge is that um, the factors that we use are US averages. And so if a company, and we're really looking, um, so what these labels uh, do well is comparisons across food categories. Um, what they don't do as well is comparisons within food categories. So comparing uh, two different types of wheat, what you really want for that is a full life cycle assessment um, for that particular product and all the details of that product. Um, but that's not, so if a, an individual company wanted to put a, a label on their own product, then they would most likely want to do a, a full life cycle assessment so that it's really reflecting their products emissions and all of the choices that they're making along the supply chain. Um, so the labels that we have, I think are, are more useful if you're comparing across recipes or doing these, these broader comparisons across food types. They don't really get into the nuances of the um, nuances of the supply chain where you really need a full life cycle assessment. So I your your question was the 
a very big one about stumbling blocks. And I, I think there are there are many um, in terms of, of policy, in terms of uh, picking the right reference diet, picking the right factors even. And so what our goal here was really to put out a methodology uh, to calculate um, these footprints and to develop an algorithm to convert the emissions information into something that a uh, rating that could be more broadly used. But uh, for broader application, I, I think we would need more discussion around the reference diet and even the specific factors that are, are being used by application. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Adi, for that. Um, I see that Joe in the yeah. Uh, Joe in the chat has also raised their hand. So Joe, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question too. Yeah, hi there. Um, yeah, fantastic talk. Um, really aware of the carbon footprint and hadn't really been aware of, sort of the nitrogen and water and the other footprints. So that was really interesting. Um, I'm doing my PhD in earth sciences. So I kind of come from a science background with this interest as well and earth system processes. But I also run a food business, which is called Sci Recipe. So that's hence my um, Zoom title there. Um, and, you know, I'm still a startup stage at the moment, but I do want to grow into this business. And one of the things that we're being encouraged to do as food businesses is to sign up and become a B corporation, which I believe was started in America and it's now taking off in the UK. Um, and part of that is it's 200 questions and it is all about your um, value chain and your sustainability within your value chain. Um, it's like every three years and the idea is your numbers have to go up each year um, in order to regain your certification. So to me, it's a really good thing. It's, it's holding businesses accountable to these sorts of things. Um, so it's something I'm interested in and looking at. But I suppose a comment I want to make and something I think you've just mentioned is that at least in the UK, and I'm, I'm trying to remember all the legislation names, at least in the carbon footprint, the carbon emissions belong to the company when they're producing the product. And then it's the consumer, so the, the, the labels on those products that the consumer is buying, the emissions don't necessarily belong to the consumer. It's held accountable under the business. Any, con, any emissions that the consumer holds is, say, driving their car to the supermarket to buy that product. And any, say, gases they use to cook it in their, you know, on the hob or in the oven. So that's something I was just thinking about with calculating the numbers and how that's then subdivided out, because you almost don't want to calculate the emissions twice or hold two different people accountable for the same group of emissions. Um, and, and this is really, it's, I don't have a question really, it's just more comments and things that, one example that I've seen of a B Corp is um, BrewDog. And um, so instead of telling the customers, this is how many carbon emissions they're now accountable for, what they now do on the menus because of their B Corporation status is they write the, the amount of CO2 emissions that say their beer takes to produce or their pizzas or whatever it is that you buy in their restaurants. And I was in there one day and I was reading it and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And it, the, you know, the meat pizzas have a higher number than the vegetarian pizzas. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that's trying to force people, you know, guilt trip them into buying the vegetarian pizza. And actually, if you read their small print, what it actually means is that BrewDog will then offset the carbon emissions from that pizza. So it's actually removing the guilt because somebody can go in then and order that meat pizza, but it's BrewDog themselves that are say planting the trees and removing the CO2 equivalent to that pizza. So the consumer then can walk away without that guilt because that CO2 emission is not from them then, BrewDog has offset it. So, I was, you know, I was just wondering, there's obviously like the research and thinking about things, but then there's the real life applications and the practicalities of running a business in order to do that. So, anyway, some thoughts. Yeah, that sounds like a really neat program. And um, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the concepts you were talking about there all relate to system bounds, which are so important for any kind of modeling or footprint analysis. And 
Um, the way that those emissions are grouped based on a responsibility of the entity of interest is a concept called uh, scopes. So what you were referring to for um, direct emissions, um, so the company producing the food, their direct emissions that um, they, they for, from processes they own or operate, those are scope one emissions. Um, so for a university, that would be um, like the, the fuel burned for heating at their on-site um, heating plant. Um, the, the vehicles they own be the emissions from those vehicles. So it's the direct emissions and scope two is um, purchased electricity. So a pretty narrow category there. And then scope three is um, everything else that is indirect. Um, so for example, uh, food purchasing at a university or food emissions for an individual person, um, or what they consume would all be scope three. So those are somebody else. So all scope three emissions are somebody else's scope one emission. So for the food that I eat, they're part of my like scope three emissions because um, they're indirect emissions from my choices but those uh, emissions are also scope one emissions from the producer. So it's all about assignment of ownership and how directly related um, those emissions are um, to the entity. So the scope concept comes a lot up a lot when you're looking at like, a, a university's or organization's footprint, but also relevant for an individual because you're absolutely right. Like the, the um, we're not the ones um, that are necessarily like growing the food, that's enough. That's a different company organization, um, the farmer, but our choices are still driving the production of that food to some extent and the, the emissions indirectly. <laughs> and also the, the B Corp part, thanks for bringing that up. That's another great way, um, it's a great way for companies um, to, to make a commitment to sustainability and your, your organization sounds really neat. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly, I'm not sure how long, how far you are into the process, but a program uh, we actually have at UNH is, uh, we call it the B Impact Clinic, where we work with um, small um, businesses and organizations and pair them with students who are learning about B Corp certification and help the companies along with the process. So we do that for B Corp certification and also for uh, the carbon footprint for organizations. So a way to uh, help those uh, small businesses and companies while also training students um, in these skills. I'll, I'll be in touch. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Um, so I have a question that kind of follows on from um, what you were just discussing there. I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are, Ali, on um, where the effectiveness of labels, if they were to be more broadly implemented, like comes from because I like there's for example there's the anecdotal stories of um, how by putting um, like an environmental metric on fridges kind of fridge companies then kind of competed with each other to see who could have the highest rating in terms of energy efficiency so even though when polled most consumers weren't that fussed about the energy efficiency actually by putting this there it made all the companies try and be the best and but then of course there's also the consumer behavior which you kind of highlighted within your talk and i'd be interested to know what yeah where you think that label effectiveness would actually come if implemented like you know on a national scale about the consumer but we really need changes to tackle these these challenges we need changes on the consumer end in terms of what we're choosing to eat and also need changes on the production end in terms of improving efficiencies um, and reducing emissions wherever we can so i um I, I love that example, the refrigerator example, where the, the company started competing with each other because, I mean, that's exactly what we need, right? Competition to have the lowest emissions where it becomes something that's, that's marketable even. Um, and you said that the consumers maybe weren't quite as interested in that, but it might have had some impact on purchasing and got emissions down overall. Um, I know there's been some efforts in um, the U.S. for labeling. Environmental Defense Fund had a, a Bay-friendly milk label they were putting out, which I think had somewhat of a, a similar concept where the idea being that it'd be um, uh, farmers that um, wanted to, to share the work that they were doing from a sustainability perspective and then could put a label on their products. So getting um, those, those producers involved as well. So I guess I'm not sure where exactly the labels would be most effective, but that I think there's potential um, you know, all along the supply chain and that we really need changes all along the supply chain to improve sustainability. There's not just one point that we need to address, it's really uh, changes across the supply chain. And, and kind of follow on from that is, I wonder if you um, have any thoughts on whether or not the carbon, carbon well, the, the footprint label is 
the most effective form of label to use to try and you know alter behavior if you're looking at it from the consumer perspective for example you think about like graphic warning labels that exist on like cigarette packages and things like is that potentially more effective do you think that just providing information is the best way to do it or something more relative like you say with the star labels that you talk about or like you also gave the examples of trying to convert the label rating into something more understandable like you know the amount of showers it is relative to i wonder what, what your thoughts are on whether or not in your opinion the footprint label is the the optimal way of you know of measuring of, of trying to influence it to your behavior yeah that's a that's a great question so from um the reading i've done about the, the studies looking at uh what encourages consumers to make changes um is that they're going to make changes from a label if it already aligns with their existing values. So the labels aren't really changing um, a consumer's values that they're going to pay attention to it if it already aligns with their values. Um, so from that respect, the, the footprint labels are, are probably mostly <laughs> affecting decisions from folks that would already be trying to make more sustainable decisions. They already have environmental concern. Um, and there's also uh, one thing that we, we discussed quite a bit and, and struggled with and, and why we settled on the star label was because there's lots of different reasons that people uh, pick a particular food product, that there's lots of other labels on a food product. There's the, well, the type of food is one thing. Often you want to buy a particular type of food. There's nutrition information. Um, there's also, also sometimes information around like fair trade, for example, or other social aspects of um, food production that sometimes weigh more heavily for uh, consumer purchasing decisions than the, the environmental aspect. So one thing we, we wanted to do but haven't, um, haven't yet because I think it would be a challenge was find a way to integrate uh, across environmental and social footprints. Um, which I don't know how you would, would weight those. That would be one of the, the biggest challenges there, I think, how to weight across environmental concerns and um, social concerns. But uh, that, that's one, one thing we, we talked about wanting to do because there's lots of information um, about uh, the production of every food product that uh, ranges across the supply chain and all sorts, hits on all sorts of different types of impacts. So, um, I think what you might have been getting at, Jack, was whether the um, the impacts that show a, a, a like a, a negative impact from a product are, are more effective or having a more um, positive impact. And and I'm not sure. I'd be interested to know um, what you all think in terms of um, the the research you all have done. If what what labels you all found to be most effective. Uh, I, I, yeah, I would just say on that very quickly, and then I'll throw it to you, Adash. You've raised your hand. Um, is that I think. Generally, you know, um, I, I can't remember where, but I think the way it works is that environmental messaging often is quite counterintuitive relative to a lot of what other behavioral science says in the way. So, you know, kind of, for example, like loss framing generally is quite a good way of change, influencing behavior. You know, you highlight what the, the losses are and what the problems are involved in too, but actually with environmental research, a, a gain frame can actually be quite more, a lot more effective. So talking about this is what is gained from switching to this product. So I, I don't know how, how um, unilaterally that extends, but I know that there is some research demonstrating that in certain instances, environmental messaging is counterintuitive relative to research on other messaging. But Adarsh, I'll throw it over to you now with your, with your hand up. Thank you so much. That was a great question and something that we've been pondering as well. Um, so I've been e constant for a while, uh, studied econ uh, literature and um, one, so I, I, I referenced the startup we're working on. It's very new, but the idea we're working, trying to like speaking to folks at U Chicago Dining and also some restaurants in Chicago to see if we can um, sort of like, uh, if there could be opportunities to do some sort of like sustainable labels, but in conjunction with sort of trying to introduce uh, economics into this angle of like trying to get folks to be more sustainable. Um, and one sort of paper that I think is very relevant is John List, who is um, a prolific econ researcher. One paper he wrote was about health and how to get people to eat more healthy. And what they found was that information helps only so much. Um, but if you couple information with sort of like pecuniary benefits, right? So if you, you get sort of more um, uh, sort of dollars back or some sort of like a pecuniary incentive, if you buy more fresh fruits and vegetables, they found that that together, that tandem worked um, much better. 
So like from my perspective, it sounds like, you know, it's a good opportunity for governments, et cetera, to get involved, to try to see if they could offer some sort of subsidi subsidies in some form to encourage grid. And for example, in the US, it's, it, it doesn't make sense that fresh foods and vegetables and salads are so expensive. Um, so I think that seems to be a big pullback. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I sort of just wanted to ask one more thing in terms of supply chains and thinking about how to um, calculate carbon and uh, sort of two interrelated questions. So one is, how do you think about, say, um, the agency held by a small restaurant versus like a larger corporation, where, for example, if you were to provide labels on foods, um, the larger corporation presumably would have greater control over where they source from, perhaps they even grow some of their own food. And so they have greater control in introducing and like um, capability to introduce sustainability initiatives, it, uh, whereas a smaller restaurant may have difficulty procuring, um, quote unquote, like sustainable produce. And um, a second related question is, you know, how are there ways to, without doing a full-blown LCA, which takes up a lot of time and money, um, to conduct sort of um, more reliable estimates within a product category for, say, smaller farms. So if you're getting strawberry from one source versus the other, um, you know, are there ways to think about, well, these are the big chunks that contribute to the carbon emissions of, you know, and uh, strawberries. And so you just focus on the hotspots and therefore you sort of improve your estimate instead of giving a full blown LCA based uh, number. That's something I've been interested in exploring, but obviously as just a pure econ student, I don't have enough um, abilities to answer that question. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I have a lot of questions, so it would be great if you have the time that is to connect with you offline as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to. That'd be great. Um, just a uh, quick thoughts on your your question. So there are some ways to kind of fine tune the average emission factors to a particular product without doing a full LCA. Um, the nitrogen factors, for example, we have um, state specific estimates. So if you know what state the product is produced in, um, the average rates of fertilizer application um, vary, even if you know the actual rate of fertilizer application and the, the yield, um, you can definitely fine tune those without information of every step along the um, supply chain. And the water factors are um, very location dependent. So if you look at different regions, um, different levels of um, uh, rainfall versus irrigation needs, um, those water factors will vary quite a bit um, by, by region. Um, so there's definitely some things you can fine tune the, those factors to better match a particular situation um, rather than using the US averages. So I'd be happy to, to chat more about that offline and that is a uh, um this, this group asks you all some really fantastic um questions so there's this one about who the the agency and um who um the 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 small restaurant example versus the corporation uh, i mean i think you're you're absolutely right that there's more um that the the corporation might have um, more more resources, more ability to to make some of those decisions than the small restaurant. But I, I think that we again need uh, you know both to be making changes um, to have a a um, uh, more diverse and sustainable and resilient food system. We need we need changes all all the way across the the spectrum. And so maybe the, the small restaurant isn't able to do quite as much, but maybe has some opportunities in terms of messaging or, or partnering with um, some, some local farms or providing some more vegetarian options, perhaps. So um, yeah, I think we all, we all have a, a role to play, I think. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, conscious, I'm conscious of time, Ali. So um, if you have somewhere to go, please just like let us know and we'll, we'll go. I, I have maybe one, last question to ask and then if you know if you know you if time is running out just say i'll email you about that or something or if not we'll, we'll figure something out we'll see what's going on um but my my question is have you um have you actually attempted any implementation with your like at the universities beyond just kind of you know these these experiments or these controlled trials or anything or the kind of the work that you do in kind of trying to conceptualize how it works and if so 
I'd be interested to know what your experience of the pushback is and, you know, how maybe universities or businesses or ways that you've been attempting to bring these labels in, what have been the complaints that have, you know, the, the companies or whoever it is, whatever institutional organisation has had with attempting to do that? Yeah, so I think um, we haven't done any broad application of the labels yet. So the applications we've done have been um, at university dining halls um, and um, at initiatives like the uh, the recipe newsletter that, that I shared earlier. And so I think they've um, largely been to, to friendly audiences. So we haven't had um, much pushback to them and they've been pretty focused in terms of their messaging. So one challenge of applying a label like this broadly is that there is a bit of calculation time required. Um, I mean, the calculations, we have the, the food label toolkit to try to make them easier, but you still need to know information about the types and weights of the major ingredients in the food product. And so that's one reason that we haven't done a more broad application when we've applied them in um, dining halls or cafes. It's been to small cafes and had a, a team of students for the, the UVA cafe. They wanted to be very precise and they actually um, got one of each of the products and, and weighed every single individual ingredient to ensure they had the, the exact weight of all of the ingredients for their study. Um, that's kind of the extreme end. You don't necessarily need to go need to go that far. You can get um, averages in terms of the average weight of a, a slice of cheese or of a slice of bread or whatever. Um, so there are some limitations in terms of the, the time for doing the calculations for applying them to an entire dining hall. So we've had more focused uses of them for like sustainability events or um, you know, newsletters or, or studies, but haven't done any um, broader applications yet. We um, have had some um, discussions with um, organizations that uh, have blogs um, for, for home bakers that want to use these to look at, for example, like a, a sustainability makeover for a recipe. So how, what types of ingredients can you sub out um, to, to make um, at-home cooking and baking um, more sustainable? So we've explored avenues like that, but haven't done any broad application yet. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd also just like to very quickly throw a thank you out to Emma Garner in the chat for dropping some really interesting links and some really interesting information about gender and perceptions of what being green is and lifestyle emissions and all these sorts of things. So thank you so much, Emma, for that as well. Um, um, maybe to, to, to save this conversation lasting until 2023. We should probably call it there. Um, but if anyone has future questions, I presume you left your email in the, the presentation, right? So um, are people able to reach out to you if they want to discuss things further? Yeah, fantastic. Okay, and I know I would love to have a follow-up chat with you at some point as well, individually, just to talk about things related to this topic. Yeah, I just put my um, email in the chat there for anyone that wants to, to reach out, be happy to chat more. Amazing. So thank you so much, Ali. This has been absolutely amazing. And like I say, I could sit here all day and you've been already receiving loads of praise in the chat from people who unfortunately have to leave early and now from people who are gearing up for the end of this. So just again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for coming down and being so erudite and interesting in your responses and the way that you spoke. And I just found the whole thing fantastic. And I'm sure everyone in the in the audience agrees as well. So on that note, um, just yeah, thanks very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. This is such a fun discussion and I hope to hope talk to some of you some more in the future. This is such a fun and um, and I think important topic. <laughs>